Hi, I'm Rob Doubleday, Executive Director at CSAP and host of our Science and Policy podcast. Welcome to another episode of our new series on science advice and government, brought to you in partnership with the research project Expertise Under Pressure, part of the Centre for the Humanities and Social Change at the University of Cambridge. In this episode, we're interested in questions about which scientific voices are heard, how one voice or many shapes the information that is informing decision making, and what kinds of structures and institutions have evolved over recent decades to try and make that process more open, more diverse, more robust. Very pleased to be joined by Professor John Agar, who's Professor of Science and Technology Studies at UCL. John is a historian of science, science and government in the 20th century. Uh, One of the things he's interested in is uh, the history of science and government, uh, and has a recent book, Science Policy Under Thatcher, which looks particularly at Margaret Thatcher's premiership and the science policy at that period. Um, And we're also joined by Dr. Claire Craig, who's Provost of Queen's College, Oxford. Claire worked in the Government Office for Science in 2002 to 2006, running their Foresight Programme, and then again as the Director of the Government Office for Science from 2011 to 2016. She was then the Chief Science Policy Officer at the Royal Society before taking up her current role in Oxford. But I want John to really start with what a historical insight can add to the discussion of science, advice and government. Um, Clearly, lots of people are very concerned about how governments use science today, but we are interested here to explore how the kinds of ways that the British government listens to science is informed by history of, of the way that government has drawn on science and engaged with science. And I know that you've looked at the archives, uh, um, mm. looked at science policy in the 1980s, when Margaret Thatcher was obviously a very prominent prime minister with herself a background in science. I mean, do you see any common threads between how science advice worked in the 1980s in, in Britain and the kind of world we, we are now in? Yeah. Thanks, Rob. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, in many ways, the world of the 1980s and Margaret Thatcher's governments was similar to ours. She had a chief scientific advisor. She had committees to offer further advice. And there were political pressures as well. So science offered advice, but it was still the politician's job role to take that advice as one of many strands to consider. Um, So there was plenty of political pressures as well on any matter that involved the sciences. So you had plenty of issues that depended on a scientific understanding of the world. And these could be things like new pandemics, such as AIDS, uh, new techniques, such as um, the use of embryos in medical research, or it might be emergencies, things like Chernobyl, for example, in 1986, a nuclear uh, reactor catastrophically breaking down in what was then the Soviet Union. So there's plenty of events, but broadly speaking, the the setup was very comparable with today. You had advisors close to government, um, you had committees offering further advice, but you also had the whole background of regular politics, of all the other demands of what people want in their in a world um, being expressed through, through ministers, through parliament, also through, if you like, the more ideologically trained experts within number 10 who would be offering advice. John Fairclough, you mentioned, was the government chief scientific advisor at the time. I mean, did were there episodes where John Fairclough had the ear of the prime minister and, and what, what were the conditions that enabled John Fairclough to have, to have a voice? Or was it more characterised by other scientists with more perhaps direct roots to the prime minister um, um, exercising their voice. Yeah. So if you take making policy about science as our topic, um, and you'd expect the chief scientific advisor to be one of those most influential voices in guiding any decisions being made. And what's most interesting is that for much of Margaret Thatcher's administration in the 1980s, that was the case. 
the, the voice of first John Ashworth, and then it was uh, Robin Nicholson. The two scientific advisors that she first worked with were quite influential. But the third one, John Fairclough, who came from IBM, from the world of business, you might expect that to be a, quite a close connection with Margaret Thatcher's vision of, of learning from business to guide um, uh, UK public life. Crucially, around 1987, he has very little access to Margaret Thatcher. And what becomes more influential is not a scientist at all, but a member of the number 10 policy unit, um, a man called George Guise, who had come from the world of uh, mining, um, but is not any scientific uh, expert, I would say. But his view about what science was, about what lessons we can learn from science is past, and especially the best relationship between government funding of science and pure and applied science, he makes these arguments, wins Thatcher over his point of view, um, and science policy changes as a result. So, for example, money is taken away from what was called near market research, applied research, where the government might fund it. And I, this is quite a profound change. It was if we don't fund, if the government can't shape applied research largely through funding, then it loses one of the major strategic levers that it has in sort of directing where an economy might go. And this was, I think, a major break. So one lesson, Rob asked me, what happens when you have many or few people in the room in the conversation? Well, I would say with science policy, it's essential to have an open conversation, one where many voices are heard. But crucially, in the late 1980s, it got narrowed down to just one influential voice, um, with, I would say, quite poor results. Can you say a little bit more about George Geis? Yeah. And, and so what he, background he brought into the role and anything about how to make sense of, of why he cared about this question about government not funding near market science? So around number 10, you obviously have the Cabinet Office and a whole series of committees, including expert committees, where officials and other experts feed in advice. We also have around number 10, the number 10 policy unit, which in the 1980s um, was a much more political beast. If you want to know where does the real ideological push for a more Thatcherite, as we might understand it, agenda comes from, it's from the people in the number 10 policy unit. These are the ideologues. Um, people like John Redwood would be there. Uh, for example, these are the closest equivalent would be someone like Dominic Cummings under, under Johnson. You've got to picture that kind of figure, someone who is behind the scenes and has, has quite some influence, but in a political dimension, in a political way. And so guys is a member of the number 10 policy unit. They comment on, they try and push forward policy agendas, party agendas, and are often much more pithy, much more willing to have an argument, I would say, than, than perhaps some parts of the civil service might be. But what Guise does is he does have a strong interest in science. He's got a great interest in leading scientists. He gets very excited, for example, when Abdus Salam, the, the, the great theoretical physicist, comes by. He tells all the civil servants, you absolutely must come and meet this man. And he also gets um, very interested in the ideas of Max Perutz, the Cambridge uh, molecular biologist, who is very against government telling individual scientists what their research agenda should be. And he takes this idea and he mines history of science for as many examples he can find of pure science leading to, in an unpredictable fashion, to great economic benefits in a way that you could never predict. And so his conclusion from all that is, to cut a long story short, you must fund pure science, but don't try and direct it. And governments must stay clear of applied science because that's business's job. And from that point on, you get a science policy which has a small state role, except in supporting pure science, gets out of the way of the individual 
scientist, researcher, entrepreneur, something that looks much more like a Thatcherite science policy. Um, and it basically comes from guys presenting these arguments to Thatcher in 1987. And so how do you sort of account for the influence that he had? Was it that he was presenting the right, an argument that was just fitted the, the political moment and so therefore was accepted and, and there wasn't the sort of challenge around him as he presented that to the Prime Minister? I think some of the challenge gets removed. So there's documentary evidence that John Fairclough found it difficult to get a face-to-face -face meeting with Thatcher during the crucial months. There was an alternative on the table. It came from the advisory body council of the research councils, the advisory board of the research councils, sorry, um, which, if you like, is the culmination of the regular research council setup that wanted a much more mission-oriented science policy, a much more directed one. And that was the alternative on the table. So it's always important when you look at these moments to look at what other things, other routes were possible. And there's no doubt that they were, but I think it's true to say that only one had the close attention of the person who in the end was going to make the policy or decide the major outlines of the policy, in this case, the prime minister. She did have a special role with science policy, which stemmed from the fact that she had trained as a scientist and viewed it as something within her comprehension and she makes that makes that plain right from the summer of 1979 so this didn't happen under major for example uh, in the in the 1990s i'll be very interested to know what what claire's experience was later on that in some ways was a different case claire i want to turn to you really to reflect on some of the themes that john started to open up based on your experience joining the Government Office for Science in 2002 to set up the Foresight Programme. And does John's account of that relationship between science advisor, prime minister, the, and the kind of political kind of filter in number 10 um, resonate with your experience? Um, so um, some does and some doesn't, but there's a really important um, distinction. Um, and, and, and John's interesting comments are making me wonder kind of quite uh, what it was that um, happened between the situation that you're describing, John, and, and when I joined the civil service. And that's this. Um, it was taken for granted by people like Dave King, who was then government chief scientific advisor, that their job was not in any way uh, to do what you've just described. In other words, we have this massive distinction between policy for science and science for policy, and a kind of taken for granted assumption that blurring that meant that the science for policy would be less effective. In other words, if you were seen as being a self-interested scientist walking into number 10 and making a case on climate change, and you were lobbying for more money for science, then you would not be heard when you were trying to get your scientific evidence across. And we basically took that as axiomatic. And, and, and I don't know kind of quite where that came in and whether it was a reaction to the situation that you're describing or, or not. And I think it may have been particularly important in those days around the climate change debate when it was uh, one of the arguments that was used against scientists making the case in public for anthropogenic climate change was well you would say that wouldn't you because we want you know you want bigger models and more funding um i don't know but nevertheless that distinction um actually remained I think it still remains important today. And you can see that, can't you, from the, the sort of the split um, really between the, the government chief scientific advisor and I mean, what used to be the director general for the research councils and is now probably something else, but the, the, science, the policy for science is separate. And, and there'd be another conversation to be had about that. Um, I mean, I think that the, the, you know, the grand person, the central person, the, I mean, all of that is all, I mean, I presume has always been true and certainly still is true. And to a certain extent, you can kind of tease out general trends and then you just have to acknowledge people. The, the immediate thought for me would be that, I, I mean, I joined, Dave King was trying to um, establish a wholly new notion of what foresight was. There had been a kind of technology assessment roadmap solution um, in the late 1990s. And um, they have this model of really big, um, what we now call evidence synthesis, coupled with more speculative futures work, but distinct from them. And um, I mean, that was a very exciting model for its time. And, I, and it had a following wind, partly because, um, I mean, I think there'd be many reasons, but one of them was that it was the same time that 
Jeff Mulgan, for example, was at the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. Now, that's not quite as a political appointment, although it's as, as a kind of equivalent of Dominic Cummings. But, you know, nevertheless, there were influential people in Number 10 in more frequent contact with the Prime Minister um, who were never who were also saying, look, hold on, there's some really important stuff with this, you know, scientific evidence and actually you can weave it into decisions and you should do. So we were, there was a bit of kind of the, the time was right. The other, which is bigger than personalities, but is still about individual relationships, is this business about if you provide science advice when they know you need they need you, then they're more likely to listen to you when you're telling them things that they don't want to hear, which would be for Dave King, the whole um, story around foot and mouth and providing robust epidemiology that it is credited with correcting formerly weaker advice from within a department and helping uh, Blair as it was to deal with that outbreak. And as a result of that, essentially building the credibility of the science advisor as science advisor. Um, and that that's a relationship, or well, that's a kind of natural transactional um, learning that I think you've actually probably seen repeated in, in diff slightly different ways in different sets of relationships between a prime minister and a government chief scientific advisor. Um, yeah. This is, you know, absolutely the, the sort of questions we want to get at. I mean, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about particularly how the foresight work was set up in 2002 or when you joined the government office for science and what was the question or the problem that establishing this sort of new mechanism was designed to solve the perennial of um twofold the, one is the perennial of challenge of governments of finding any sort of space for dealing with the longer term and in my experience i think ministers know that they're making decisions that will affect countries for you know decades or centuries but actually very rarely have any kind of space to acknowledge that uh, at anything more than a kind of you know high level a statement uh, of vision and so that was one and coupled with that this sense that i mean i suppose the sense that almost the opposite of what what john was describing at one point the sense that no, a strong sense that no one person could answer every question or indeed any question um, and that therefore there had to be better mechanisms for drawing on different people within the same field and also drawing on multiple fields because any major policy question needs evidence from more than one field so so a kind of yeah uh, almost I want to say professionalization I mean it was part of as well of the civil service constantly examine its conscience about the cult of the generalist you know you could no more have a generalist scientific advisor than you could have a generalist um, uh, permanent secretary was the, the notion and out of that on the one hand came this space which was an amazing privilege in many ways and and you know almost almost unique around the world in which the combination of an influential government chief scientific advisor a willing number 10 um, environment and indeed there were others um, in the parliamentary setting who were really keen on it um, you know created this space to do explicit work looking 10 to 100 years out which is pretty amazing you know and had to be defended against um, departments wanting only to focus on short-term questions or budgetary pressures to take away the bit of money that you have you know all that kind of stuff that normally means that, that departments and ministers can't do this so there was a, a coming together of conditions that created that space there's a good historical yeah. parallel as well claire i was just thinking in the early 1970s time of limits to growth that projected using scientific methods compute and models mit skills um 50 100 years ahead and it was read in in, in whitehall with, with great interest they didn't buy the conclusions but just the idea of simulating and being able to project opened up a space um, because they got quite excited by it and was one of the very first times that climate change began to be mentioned yeah. in Whitehall. And it's you're absolutely right. Unless you, I think it's a powerful sense, unless that's that space to look forward was created and maintained, it doesn't happen. And the same that's that cycle happened again with the the, the introduction of the horizon scanning, yeah. the foresight yeah. um, that we had in the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, and I, I, I think then an interesting question is whether it was, uh, as it were, largely about the people um, or whether it was also about the issues, because the two issues that we started the foresight programme with under this new 
regime were blood risk in the UK Act 2080, which was basically um, an attempt to make visceral um, the implications of the latest climate change modelling. And it did because it created these maps that showed on 10 kilometer squares whether your house was going to be you know flooded in 2080 or not or your constituency was going to be flooded uh, more to the point uh go into the sun all the newspapers covered those pictures that was they, an amazing act of communication about climate change yeah 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 so um uh, so, so 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 that's on the one hand and then the other project which um was got much, much less publicity but i think with hindsight was also an interesting choice was called cognitive systems and it was a bringing together of neuroscientists and um and computer scientists uh, in what was really although we didn't know it the beginning of the big wave of interest in ai and the kind of and, and it was before deep learning was a term properly, um, but it was the beginning of that. So both of these were areas where science was either creating or had an awful lot to say about major policy, potentially policy issues. And then we went on to do a whole load of other things. Um, but I think I think there was also a sense that there was something big happening that needed this space as well. I mean, that's, that's very interesting sort of echoes with, with what John talked about in terms of the, the coming together of, of the issues, the timing and the, and the people um, that created that space. But I, I'd, I'd like to turn to a little bit about the sort of the mechanisms. Um, so as, as the foresight projects were being sort of developed um, in, in, in the noughties, I'm David King as the Chief Scientific Advisor and, and you as the civil servant running the programmes, were you sort of inventing a set of mechanisms from scratch? What were you drawing on when you were thinking about, you know, which expert voices you were going to bring in, how you were going to sort of choreograph the process of getting them to you know, express their evidence on the question? And then how did you sort of attempt to synthesize that into a coherent document message that you felt could resonate with, with policymakers and the political times that you were writing them in? Um, so I'm sure that um, everything that we did was being done somewhere by somebody, but the big shift was towards being deliberate about evidence synthesis, basically, deliberately saying there's a task here, which is taking the best available knowledge within a field on a particular question or issue and investing in finding the people who could develop that and make that statement in quality assuring it and in making it communicable and accessible to other people in other disciplines and to ministers and publics and acknowledging that as a significant task i think um it felt at the time as if that was actually new on to be doing it on scale so uh, that was a huge chunk of it and i mean if you look at some of the uh, foresight projects also under john beddington you know there were 50 state-of-the-art science reviews i think on global food and farming you know these were quite in, these were industrial projects in one sense but the thing is that nobody in government was doing it and and the research councils don't fund that kind of thing they still don't actually it's the kind of secondary knowledge creation knowledge transfer knowledge brokering that csap is all about but that uh, it is relatively um, sort of less focused on. So Foresight was doing that, but then it was also, and this was very much also, I think now kind of a sign of the times, a futures work and anticipation sort of studies were beginning to get going. And Shell was still, Shell was still the big case from the 70s um, and their use of futures, but then it had been done in South Africa as well as part of um, post-apartheid thinking. So there was beginning to be some interest in the value of acknowledging uncertainty in the future and not trying to predict it, not trying to control it, but learning what you can, could from plausible anticipations. And Foresight was doing some of that too, in really quite um, innovative ways. I mean, I actually was going back the other day, but, um, we um, employed Kate Moss, who's since become quite a well-selling novelist to write um, stories on our project on exploiting the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you know, it, we were trying different ways of communicating and engaging. What Foresight then didn't do, which it has done more of on the Royal Society with its more forward-looking work has done, is really, really acknowledge public engagement and public dialogue, not in the kind of citizen jury sense, because that's another really big set of issues that needs to be dealt with properly. And I don't think the Government Office for Science would be the right place for that. But in the sense of being more deliberate about understanding what kinds of questions people might have and thinking about how the evidence that you're gathering might begin to answer them. And that began to evolve more as I think foresight model got more established and indeed as the kind of pressures to be more open and also to acknowledge different forms of knowledge 
began to broaden. But I mean, even in, in your sort of starting point, Rob, I mean, I think still within the Government Office for Science or within the Royal Society, the notion that there might be different forms of knowledge is really important, but actually the quality of the advice and the quality of the science and the quality of the evidence is still seen to be the absolutely key thing to enable a well-founded um, decision. I mean, John, does that You've been party to many of the discussions, both including at the Royal Society. Is that how it seems to you? In, a, in a quite a small way, thank you, Claire. But yes, it's, it's very interesting to see it also from inside, because I do think there's a difference between what you can understand from this process from inside and what you might get if you only viewed it from outside. And seeing the deliberation, I think, is, is quite impressive. I wonder whether you think, though, that if it had any flaws or problems in your in the period I'm I've been looking at the, the select committee investigation of horizon scanning and our understanding of risk and our understanding of advice in this period and it's quite critical in a way of, of some of it but also it's also amazing in retrospect what they don't pick up so for example they're very very critical of coming up with a or identifying uh, worst case scenarios. This is in the case of, in the context of swine flu, where someone had dared to say 65,000 people might die from a pandemic. And they're livid that such an outrageous, implausible situation might be uh, articulated and publicised. And But it reminds us that the scrutiny at the time this process, it was being looked at critically, but often that criticism could have been more robust, I think, and more evidence-based. Were there any problems with making it work oh, at the time? And you could argue that the horizon scanning was part of a system that, that meant that there was more science going into these kind of risk assessments and risk registers, and the knowledge about what to be prepared for was getting further into government, but the capacity to deal with that knowledge was lagging behind. And I think you could say the same with the Foresight Project. I mean, if you go back to those flood maps, then some things that, 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 that will have happened and did happen, and you know, we saw funding happen and we saw flood management schemes happen, that where people said they were doing that because of this work, which is about as good as causality as you get in you know, science policy. Um, but on the other hand, almost certainly at some point, it will prove to be the case that it wasn't enough. Yeah. Um, uh, and the question about you know, whether we could have gone further with the evidence or we could have gone further to have shaped the evidence such that other people could have gone further with the politics. <laughs> I think that's an interesting question. Whether, yeah. whether to your point about, you know, when somebody says X thousands of people will die if we model it in this way or not, in some sense, I feel more comfortable in a, I mean, in a way that, that the pandemic may have, may have nudged us all along a path of public reasoning that is a little bit better at handling some of that kind of uncertainty because it's made it so clear that you can't, you can't yeah. predict. Um, no, I think I mean, I'm more, I mean, it was interesting to go back and read this with later <laughs> developments, obviously, in mind. But one positive thing you can say is in terms of identification of the risk, there's no doubt that this, the system, as it was set up, involving foresight, involving multiple expert views, had already identified it. It was there. It was in the risk yep. register very prominently. But as you said, there's a difference between identification and then, then preparation, yeah. um, which depends on resources, decisions being taken, and so on. Claire, can I ask a couple of sort of final questions about that experience of, of establishing and running the Foresight Programme? One is about diversity of scientific voices, diversity of expert voices. So you, you, meant, you talked about different forms of knowledge, public participation, but e even within the sort of the realms of disciplinary scientific input, how explicitly did you attempt to get sort of contending disciplinary perspectives? And how did you deal with mo times when there was sort of real disagreement about what was important or, or, or what the evidence um, showed? So we went 
as wide as possible in terms of the types of discipline. I think there's a whole separate issue about the humanities and to a certain extent, social sciences. Um, and I think that's a really important and fascinating area, which I'm sure you'll cover else, elsewhere, uh, but it is very important. Um, so we probably didn't do enough of that. The choice of which disciplines, I suppose ultimately um, with Foresight, the specific model was uh, that there was an initial set of discussions which led to the appointment of a steering group, uh, people who represented sort of a wide, a, a wide range of disciplines but were small enough in number that they could meet regularly and they were the ones who were key to shaping what the final question was because that's another really important point in uh, science advice which is sometimes you know the, the question you think you're being asked is not the one that really needs to be asked so that smaller group then would essentially um, make decisions about in more detail about which disciplines to draw in and about who and because it was foresight and with the biggest projects we have the time to do this there would then be quality assurance there'd be peer review basically for the state of the science um, reports so I mean clearly you know one can always go further but it was a very very deliberate attempt not to um, you know, force out controversy about an area, but to make some sort of judgments that would include uncertainty, say, where there was controversy, and present that in a way that helped move public debate forward. So in other words, you could not simply say, you know, the scientists are all over the place, they can't agree, um, unless that was completely true, in which case you would say it. But generally, there's something better than that that you can say to a minister or to the public which is you know here's the general consensus and here are the bits that are really uncertain and that's where the kind of the art and the skill of doing good evidence synthesis and doing good scientific communication comes in it's going a bit towards you know ironing out all of the natural academic hesitation and controversy and tiny points that really matter in your discipline but not going so far that you've lost the truth the the, the the really fundamental things that need to be done. That's very helpful. And I mean, effectively, you're saying it is, whilst acknowledging uncertainties and trying to bring in diverse uh, sort of disciplines, it is aiming to present a consensus view. Okay, even if it's a consensus of the uncertainty. Yeah. It's not a consensus in the sense of trying to hide uh, any of the proper uncertainty or limitations of the science. Just sort of a follow-up to, to that first question, because you talked about humanities and social sciences, and obviously within government, not all social sciences are equal, and one stands um, out, and that's economics. So, for example, take your flood risk work. W was there structured ways that, that economic analysis was, was incorporated in, into the foresight process, or was that thought that this is the sort of scientific contribution, which then later is put alongside economic and other kind of analysis in, in to inform decision making? No, no, um, these, uh, these maps of the country included things like maps of economic uh, damage, um, along with maps of lives lost or whatever it might be. Um, so um, it was built in. And it, one of the things, um, uh, and this is true of other foresight projects, but uh, more generally is, of course, we, we always knew um, that to be influential, to be yeah, to be influential, advice needed to be in a form that the Treasury would respect it where it was about economic matters. So this is, I think, leading on to the whole business about the chief scientific advisors in every department and kind of how that evolved and how that got formalised, because then part of what would what would happen in later foresight projects, certainly when I went back, is you would you would constantly be checking with advisors within individual departments, including in the Treasury, kind of what kinds of questions the findings that you were aiming to generate would be getting from that quarter so that you would be ready to have evidence that was relevant to those. So, um, so that's gone broader than just economists, but in, you can see I immediately, to, when you're thinking back to being inside government, economists just means Treasury. And it's what, you know, what questions would Treasury ask and what kind of evidence do they find influential and how do you make sure that your advice uh, includes or meshes with that? They're almost, I mean, economists are almost, they almost forget they're there because they're so yeah. prominent and have a whole department and a powerful one, the Treasury, to express the economic view. Because um, when you start saying there's one behave, one social science which is more predominant, to be honest, in things like SAGE, it's more a, a kind of behavioural science that is there, but you're nowhere near as powerful as, as economists or 
um, the economic way of arguing. Um, but that still isn't the whole spectrum of social and historical science or, hu or the humanities. And I think it's probably fair to say that discussion of these really complex, wicked problems needs the full spectrum of disciplinary perspectives across the social sciences into the humanities as well as the sciences just i uh, couldn't agree couldn't agree more um and, and i mean i think it's also i mean rather like many natural scientists uh, i got generalized hugely but kind of there's been a bit of a learning process about who wants to work with government or in the public you know in public debates and who doesn't and how you do it and uh, and how you can make it satisfying and, and part of a career. It was actually sometimes harder to get humanities scholars who were willing or able um, to take part. More often kind of worries about ideological purity. You know, if I go into a workshop in number 11 to discuss something, am I thereafter tainted in some way, whoever is in power at the time? And so, um, I mean, I, 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 and that is definitely shifting. Um, uh, but it wasn't all that the scientists were trying to keep the humanities and social scientists out. It was also a little bit of kind of, you know, this is often, this is often challenging to the personal values of the people who get deep into working with government mm. and you can see that happening a little bit I think at the moment as well. I have to say I think that that's a good additional point you've made Claire but I think there there's a nuance to that as well which is it's not just whether people want to accept the invitation to contribute their expertise it's you know on what terms and I think in the past there has been a sense that humanities and social sciences are invited in once the terms are set in terms of what the question is and and and, and sort of sure. social science is invited in to be a sort of you know cherry to communicate on the, cake. the results of the to communicate what the scientists want yeah. to say but i think yeah. that that has that has also changed over time i think for for, for yeah. the better not that yeah. there's not more progress yeah. to be made Claire, my final question to you which is really unfair because it, it's it, we don't have much time to address it but over over the evolution of the foresight program you know as they prove their effectiveness and as they, um, you know, were more ambitious in their, in what they were setting out to achieve, they got bigger, and longer, and more expensive. And and then a critique emerged was, you know, are are they worth that huge effort? You know, two or th two or three years to produce a report, huge amount of, of work, as you say, industrial scale, almost um, evidence synthesis. And there was a critique that wonderful those these things were, they they weren't worth the effort. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think that some things stay the same, right? I mean, the value of synthesizing evidence on major questions and the value of informed anticipation, explicitly thinking about the future, it seems to me to be, I would take, I would argue that that's always, always right. The, the scale is, is partly linked to the place and the structures. I mean, it was certainly the case that uh, I, I think with a longer project that um, they were getting out of kilter, uh, even with the limits of patients of kind of civil servants and of ministers. And of course, that environment was changing too. Um, uh, and you didn't have, you know, things like a very powerful prime minister strategy unit that was encouraging people to think strategically and hence, uh, you know, it was kind of, it, there, was a, there was less of a, a, a kind of, a, a less support in that, in, in that sense. And, and that was pushing back towards doing things that were quicker and, and more directly relevant to questions. I, I personally think the question then is actually, do you mean that this should never be done, these kind of bigger um, pieces? And I think there's a place to do that kind of thing. We don't have Royal Commissions anymore, yeah, like the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, and you listen to read Sue Owen's interesting work on that. You know, if foresight, if the Government Office for Science cannot do this kind of stuff because it is no longer given um, the, the space, or, or, or for any other reason, or because the times have changed and actually it needs to be done in a more participatory way with more public dialogue for example that's better done outside of government or it needs to be done outside of government because it will appear more independent all of those but somebody somebody needs to be doing it and unless there's somebody with the ear of the prime minister or the ear of ukri saying please make this happen when every research council is you know is asking for blue sky research which is not going to do it or is asking for applied research which is not going to you know so there needs to be a space it could be in several different places in the pub, in the in the general sphere of science and, and of government, I would argue, and it could be in UKRI, or it could be Royal Society and the Royal Ac the National Academy is doing more of it. I don't know, mm. but somebody needs to do it. Well, th thanks, Claire. But John, just the final question to you is: uh, having listened to that fascinating sort of um, personal account from from Claire, 
that's also reflecting on the broader the broader context for the development of foresight work in the government office of science you, you know the the, obvi- the the question we all want to ask is john you know what lessons do does science policy on the 1980s if any have for, for us today well i think one lesson is that good policy is done when you have lots of eyes on it and you look at it from different perspectives and it is properly debated and i think none of those three things happened around 1987 in the crucial decisions about science policy um so the the, the lesson is a negative one it tells you something about how not, and I think what we've heard from Claire is a much more deliberative way of making science policy with more voices, uh, more forward looking, uh, more perhaps aware of its flaws as well, that I think wasn't necessarily the case in the 1980s. Thank you, John and Claire, for joining us for today's discussion. This podcast is hosted by me. Rob Doubleday and produced by Jessica Foster with the help of researcher Nick Kostick, brought to you in partnership with the research project Expertise Under Pressure, part of the Centre for the Humanities and Social Change at the University of Cambridge. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please do follow, subscribe and share with your network. Thanks for listening. (music) 